What's up everybody? I hope you're doing well. Thanks so much for joining us and today I'm super excited because it's finally time for our second interview in the Racial Advocacy from the Therapist Chair series and it's long overdue but it's a goodie because I had the privilege of having Rachel Hypolite, licensed mental health counselor who's practicing in Florida for today's interview. And I say today's interview but you know we already did the interview and now I'm recording this part but the interview's awesome, you're about to watch it now. I really enjoyed this interview with Rachel and I think you're gonna enjoy it as well. She's incredibly down to earth and modest and she is someone who I think we all could hear from. And I had some really helpful practical takeaways from this interview as well as far as how to make sure I'm running an anti-racist practice. I mean, I'm still having to make sure I go through some of the checklist items that I made note of from our interview. So I hope you find those helpful as well. Well, without further ado, let's jump into that interview with Rachel. All right, well, Rachel, it's so nice having you. I'm so excited that you decided to join for this interview. I think you have such wonderful insights to offer. Um, so folks know we got to chat a little bit offline as well. And I think Rachel is just such a wonderful person to hear from for this this interview. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself so people kind of get a sense of who you are before we get into some of the questions? So I am a licensed mental health counselor and a national certified counselor. And I have about seven years of experience counseling from teenagers to kids all the way up to adults. And I am working towards private practice, which I'm looking to launch in April 2021. So that's very exciting. I am a happy aunt with two nieces and two nephews. And when I'm not working, I'm either reading, taking a dance class, or just randomly dancing, drawing, or doing DIY art projects. Oh, I love that. Well, um, Rachel, if you don't mind diving straight into our topic for today, would you be willing to share a little bit about the first time from what you recall that you became aware of race? Well, for me, it started in elementary school. And I remember being in a computer class and hearing statistics. And the statistics were saying things like, Black students were more likely to drop out of school. Black students were unlikely to graduate from high school. Um, black female students were very likely to get pregnant before graduating high school. And I remember my world kind of stopping when I heard those statistics because I was really curious as to why I heard nothing about any other people groups. Mm. And it just really, like, at that point, I noticed that I, I, I am, I am not white, I am brown skinned. <laughs> and it just, it just kind of hit me really hard. And at that moment, I just decided, you know, what? I'm going to prove all the statistics wrong. And I'm not going to let that, that stop me because they don't really define me. Wow. And that's where I got the motivation. <laughs> oh, there's so much wrapped up in that story of when you were essentially told, almost like here's a little bit of what your destiny is, getting mm -hmm. singled out as an elementary school student. That's terrible. I, I was probably in about second or third grade oh. when I heard those statistics. You, I kind of hear like there's a fighter attitude that came out from that. Like, mm -hmm. well, I'm just going to prove everybody wrong and I'm not going to embody any of those statistics, which Definitely. is clearly has panned out for you. Um, and it, it must be one of your strengths, but, but it's so sad to hear that um, your strength came from having to react on, on the defensive um, rather than, you know, you feeling like you were believed in and nurtured and cared for right. um, to fight and it's, back. It's really interesting because that's my first remembrance of awareness of my skin color. And at that moment, I realized that it could be used as a weapon. That's so sad to hear. Yeah. That's how it had to come, come to be. So I wonder, Rachel, if you'd be willing to share any significant moments when you've seen racial injustice occurring within our field of counseling, psychology um, in particular. So I took up this internship during graduate school completely voluntarily because it seemed interesting. 
And so that's what I did. And I worked under a psychologist and she did a lot of testing. People would call in and schedule their appointments. And when they came in, I remember her always saying that when people showed up at the door, they always, they were always surprised. They always had like this idea of her. Um, and it was as if when they saw her, something was wrong. She was a black woman and she had her own practice. And it, it just, it just kept happening where people would walk in and they'd be surprised and they'd ask mm -hmm. for a doctor and she'd present and they'd, you know, are you doctor? And it's like, yes, oh. I am. Mm -hmm. And at the moment when it was happening, I did not register the microaggression, but looking back, a lot of what was really being said is, are you sure you're the doctor? Are you sure you can handle this? Mm. Are you sure you're smart enough? Are you sure you've done the work? It was like, you have to keep proving yourself time and time again, that you've done the work and that you earn, you know, the space that you're in. That's so sad to hear this, like, constant having to prove yourself. And it sounds like this uh, doctor was you know, more than competent <laughs> beyond, but just because of her skin color, people are questioning it. And then there's so much that you're reading in between the lines. This might be skipping around a little bit, but the natural question that I can't help but wonder from that is like, if you could be in charge of, of kind of writing how therapists and in, in our field um, could do things, you know, what what would it look like? to see racial advocacy happening in our field? I think it would take counselors taking a genuine interest in mentoring and educating and taking clinicians of color and students of color who are coming up under their wing. I think it's really important for counselors, whether in private practice or in agency work, to self-reflect on their caseloads self-reflect on their marketing strategy, be mindful of who you're attracting to your practice, to yourself, and just be mindful of the people groups being served, the people groups that are being left out. Because the real question is, what's stopping people of color from being served by you in your practice? Is it cost? Is it your attitude? Is it your discomfort? I, I really love both one, how challenging that question probably feels for so many, um, but it's also so practical. Like all of us, myself included, we can evaluate our caseload, evaluate, you know, I'm even thinking down to like the pictures on my website, right? Am I, am I inclusive in, you know, it, ref, reflecting people of all colors in, in my website or, or, you know, even naming, here's how here's how I'm running an anti-racist practice or, or, or attempting to you know, uh, right. valuing that. I bet for so many therapists, it's just not even on their radar. It's not an intentional shunning mm -hmm. of a people group, but that's exactly it, that, that we have to be intentional then of noticing where are we inadvertently excluding people. Right. Um, and if we don't stop and ask that question, we might not even ever notice what we're missing and 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 potentially that that is where where we could be advocating very true which is why i say it must be genuine because if it's not we can sense that yeah. you know this is so important we have to be intentional in asking this question and, and i think i heard you say this too not just what clients am i working with but um what what therapist interns am I taking on? You know, if somebody's a supervisor, or, um, who am I employing in, in my agency? Or, and being mindful just the same of that. Uh, right. And even if you're not able to employ them for one reason or another, somehow finding a way, whether through mentorship, finding a way to invest the time. Yes. To help them be a better clinician. So Rachel, kind of continuing on this conversation, from your perspective, how well do you think our training prepares us for this role as, as racial advocates? In terms of my training, it didn't necessarily prepare me for, for the 
conversation of having of race in session. Mm -hmm. It turned it taught me about general nuances of race. Yeah. You know, like the stereotypes or, you know, these types of people prefer this or these type of people do this, but it didn't teach the the one on one mm -hmm. per se. That was, that was my experience as well, for the most part. We got work to do. <laughs> yeah, we sure do as a field. Well, so on that note, are there any tools, experiences, trainings, things of the like that have helped you personally become more culturally aware as a therapist? So there have been a few things. I, over the summer, um, shortly after multiple Black people were killed by police officers, I had the opportunity to attend a Healing While Black Summit. I went, it was online, and it was just so nice. It was so nice to be around other Black professionals. It was so mm -hmm. nice because I felt normal with everything, you know, everyone and all of the opinions out there. It, going to the summit reminded me that nothing was wrong with me. Oh for how I was feeling, for the things that were coming up. And it was just so nice. It was just like a breath of fresh air, to be honest. I also actually opened up to people who were not of color, who may have asked me during that time how I was doing. And I was actually honest about where I was and the pain that I was feeling and the difficulty that I was experiencing as a person of color. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was very vulnerable of you. Um, right. It, it, I think uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of folks might be helped by hearing like in that context, right? So you have maybe uh, non people of color, potentially white folks asking you how you're doing um, and you share vulnerably, like what would be the ideal response back to you? I think the ideal response would just be an acknowledgement of where I was and the pain that I was feeling and no defenses. Defenses went up real fast mm -hmm. and I don't understand why. And maybe that had more to do with them than it did, you know, had to do with me, Yes. but just the acknowledgement and you know, let me know if I can do anything to help you or support you or, you know, just meeting me where I was. It sounds like such a basic therapeutic response. And that's something that's been standing out to me doing these interviews, right? And when I'm inviting this question, okay, how can people better respond in this situation, that situation related to race? And mm -hmm. it's okay, I'm hearing you say, validate the pain, like, what I'm going through makes sense. How can I help you? I mean, isn't that what we do as therapists? And somehow, even if it's therapist to therapist, uh, we go to defensiveness yeah, with this yeah. topic. So kind of taking things a step further, I'm curious if you'd be willing to share a bit about how you've navigated topics of race with clients of yours who are of a different racial background than you. It's always interesting to see if they will talk about race. Mm -hmm. So I work with minors. What I like to do is based on, because there's just been a lot going on, I like to open the door and invite them to you know, share anything or is there anything that they would like to talk about in regards to the current events, mm -hmm. all right? And many don't. Many want to just continue working on what they're working on. And I have had some clients bring it up they, they just feel like they shouldn't be the bad guy because mm -hmm. they're not a person of color. And so they're like, they're defensive basically mm -hmm. when they bring it up and, or they just want to save the world. <laughs> so it's really interesting in terms of navigating how to respond. And really I just explore, you know, their response, like what's that's generating that for them. But I can't help but wonder what that's like for you to have, again, there's the defensiveness mm -hmm. um, or just avoidance, which is also a huge issue. Just I'm just going to pretend it's not there. 
Right. How is that for you as a clinician? Obviously, you're there supporting your clients, but internally, right. what's going on for you? To be honest, sometimes I'm relieved. Relief in the sense that I'm doing this, I think I've heard it called parallel processing mm -hmm. with clients as, you know, things are happening, I'm having to deal with it and, you know, work through it and they're having to do the same thing. And so on some level, it's nice to not have to address it because I'm not sure of what they're going to say. On the other hand, it's nice to be able to help them realize that everyone is important, everyone is valuable, and you can only do what you can do. Mm -hmm. So let's focus on what's actually doable for you. It, it's, it's so refreshing to hear you say that even just like, oh, it's kind of a relief when people don't want to talk about it because yeah, you're absolutely parallel processing this and, um, and we're human too. And, and so not to say that you need to avoid this because <laughs> you're right. obviously not, you're here talking to me about this, but, um, but man, there is some, there is something nice to just catch a break from having to dive yes. into it with every single client on the, along the same lines. How have you navigated the topic of race with clients of, of the same racial background as you? Now clients of the same racial background, what's interesting is we tend to speak about race or they tend to bring up race throughout their sessions. Mm. So not just as a result of what's going on in the world, not just as a result of, you know, black people being killed by police officers. It's just, they, they feel more comfortable, I guess. Mm. So it's something that we do talk about from time to time throughout their session. And I tend to, when they do bring it up, I just acknowledge, you know what, I'm processing too. I, I hear you and I understand, not exactly, but I, I get it because I'm still, I'm in the midst of it too. Mm -hmm. And so just giving them that acknowledgement and helping them to realize that it's okay for us to just sit in this discomfort and all the feelings and all the intensities of the feelings. I love that. Such a great example of a helpful self-disclosure right, of just validating, like, I am going through the same stuff right there with you. And mm -hmm. I imagine that's, that must be so powerful for your clients to hear that, that they, they must respect and admire you on so many levels. And then to hear you say that you're going through some of the same things. I do my best to help them put it into perspective, just kind of sit with the discomfort, but also help them to see that they can still move forward. Mm -hmm. You know, this isn't it. This isn't the end. It's not okay. We don't like it, but this isn't it. There's more. Mm. There's more. Where Where do you find that hopefulness from? <laughs> right when you say you're, you clearly believe what you're saying when you say this to your clients. Like this isn't mm. it. There's more. Like how do you? Where does that come from? Or how do you hold on to that belief? Mm. I think that my faith is a big part of it. But for my clients, in terms of helping them hold on to hope, this is only a point in time. And if they can just take one step, you know, one step and just acknowledge that, you know, this is just right now, they can reach for tomorrow. I imagine your capacity to hold the truth of the painful reality of the current situation, but stay grounded in the hope that it could be different. I mean, that's a huge strength of yours and whether you're directly communicating about it or not with your client it must come through in the, in the work that you do and so i'm just struck by that and how much that has to be tied to you know the work that you're doing within yourself outside of you know sitting with your clients and that that only benefits them I and mean, that's really powerful that can't be easy to just oh yeah let's just stay hopeful um, that is a testament to so much work that you yeah. have done in yourself. It's definitely not easy, but hope is definitely worth holding on to. Mm -hmm. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for answering so vulnerably and, and honestly these questions that I've kind of prescribed here, but I'd love to invite you to share if there's anything else you'd like to add that you feel is important here. I think it's really important for us to focus not on ourselves, 
but to acknowledge that other people are hurting. With everything going on, all of the racial injustice, it repeatedly brought up a few themes for me, a few themes that I wasn't even sure that it was okay for me to have thought. Mm -hmm. You know, these themes of unworthiness, these themes of unimportance, these themes of not being good enough. I felt like a target. And it, it kind of brought me back to elementary school all, all over again. And it was a challenge. It was a really hard challenge for me. And I had to realize and come to the place that these were untruths. And so I had to fight hard to disregard these truths, these things that would hold me back so that I can move forward and be confident. I limited my news intake. Mm -hmm. I slept. Sleep is so good. <laughs> I surrounded myself with family, friends who supported me. I've written down so many positive affirmations to change those negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. I journaled. I danced. I did my dance workouts. I listened to inspiring music because I was reminded throughout all of this pain and all of this process that I have to protect my heart. And I decided I wasn't gonna take in what society wanted me to take in. I was gonna take in what I needed to take in so that I can be better. I love that. And again, there, there's all that work that you're doing is that it's not fair that you've had to work so hard to create a safe, sane world to live in for yourself. but. I think so many people need to hear that, right? That, um, and I love how you framed it, that you don't have to like hold the narrative that the world is trying to hand to you and you can create some boundaries there and build your own narrative. Um, that's so powerful, so empowering. And also, as you were sharing about how there were some of these kind of insecurities that popped up along the way, yes. um, I couldn't help but just feel so grateful that you're here doing this interview and thinking, well, Clearly, this is a testament of your capacity to, to, to move through and come the other side. Um, so thank you so much for your willingness to do this. Uh, yeah, well, and, and Rachel, I wonder if there are any resources that you recommend, whether it's further reading or it could be podcasts, things like that, that could just help people continue on their journey of learning and growing here. The first thing I want to say is many resources have been given. And I, I think at this point, start doing mm. you know choose one thing choose two things and do those things don't try to do them all don't try to read all the books because there's so many to be read yes. okay there's so much knowledge to be attained but if you do nothing with the knowledge that you gain what are you doing and so the first resource i want to give is is the book called tears we cannot stop by michael eric dyson i read this book throughout this period of just grief and difficulty and it it was just a really inspiring book that, that i'd recommend anyone to sit down and read oh, i love the way you frame that first of all i'll be sure to link to that book below if anyone's yes. interested in checking it out but um like pick a lane and and do it right because right? i i do know so many people and it's tempting myself to like buy the stack of books and then, and then they it's such there. a large stack it's overwhelming <laughs> and you just oh i need to get to that but if you have this is my book or this is my audiobook or do it and implement whatever you learn from that one thing as it was right. so powerful than buying yeah. books and not reading them well rachel thank you so much for offering your time i know you prepared so much in advance as well which is just going so far above and beyond but you've offered such valuable wisdom i think anyone watching and listening could benefit and glean something meaningful from our conversation so thank you so much i really appreciate everything you're very welcome it was a pleasure to to just be here and to talk about these things because you know we're all going through it in one way or another yeah thank you so much rachel
Well, Rachel, thank you so much for joining me in this interview. Your time and your wisdom are invaluable both to me and to all the folks watching this video. And I know it's it's not easy to say, sure, I will put myself out there on video and share about some really, really vulnerable things. And uh, it's a scary thing. It's a scary thing. I get it. So thank you, Rachel. I really appreciate it. And thank you to you all for watching. I'm sure you found some helpful tidbits in there. If it felt like a lot, just pick one thing then that is a takeaway that you can do and implement in your practice or in your therapy work. And if you noticed, I did run ads at the beginning of this video. And for this video and all videos in this series, all of the ad revenue generated from the videos are going towards the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. So just by watching this video, you're also advocating and helping a good cause. Well, a huge thanks again to Rachel Hypolite, licensed mental health counselor practicing in Florida for her time and her sage wisdom in this video. And thank you for watching. I hope you found it helpful. And until next time, from one therapist to another, I wish you well.